Okay, so now we've inserted our wire into the vessel. We've removed our needle. We're gonna make a nick. Now the way I prefer to do this is to run the flat portion of this 11 blade right over the wire into the hole that you've made with your needle and make your nick. Now then this step is incredibly important. Rotate your wire in the nick you've just made to make sure there's no skin bridge between the needle insertion site and the scalpel nick. Otherwise your nick was for naught and uh, you are gonna have a much harder time dilating. So this is a 12 French dilator for a HD catheter. Uh, for most emergency medicine people, uh, critical care people, this might be one of the largest vascular lines you place unless you have experience with ECMO. Um, this is, technique is also applicable to things like pigtails, and that might be the biggest catheter in general you place. The pigtails uh, run around 14 French. Uh, if you're familiar with the percutaneous chest tube sets, then you might be placing 20 French catheters into patients. So these techniques uh, are applicable to all sorts of Seldinger techniques. And the thing is, the bigger the catheter gets, the more important good technique is. Uh, you could get away with really crappy technique when placing triple lumen central lines because uh, at seven French, even bad technique usually will work. Uh, and that's not gonna be true for these larger catheters. So let's load up our dilator onto our wire. And now I'm gonna teach you the three portions of the micro skill of dilation. The first thing to be cognizant of is that there was an angle that your needle entered the skin at. That's the angle you wanna dilate at. If you try to dilate at an angle like that, when the angle that the needle entered is like that, you're going to kink your wire and you're gonna abrade the tip of your dilator and you're gonna have big problems and you might cause vascular injury. So the angles always need to match. Now, the first thing you're going to do is a technique called push and rack. And push and rack is you put one hand on the wire at all times and I put it close to the back of the dilator. And then with my other hand very close to the skin itself, maybe a couple centimeters off, I grip the dilator. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gently insert until I get some resistance, and I have resistance right here. Now, because that's the pushing portion, I push to resistance, and now with my other hand, I do what's called racking, which is uh, gentle in and out movement of the wire to make sure that the wire is not being kinked or about to kink by the pressure of the dilator. And now at this point, I have two choices depending on how rapid this dilation needs to be. Before we get into your two choices, let me uh, just go over one more incredibly important point. Your wire stays stationary as the dilator moves over the wire, meaning wherever that J tip of that wire exists within the vessel, it never actually gets moved forward or backwards as that dilator is being pushed in against it. Uh, so I like to think about it as a monorail. The monorail's track doesn't move. The monorail can move forward or backwards over it, but the, the track itself, in this case, the wire stays stationary. So as you're trying to push that dilator in, especially as the dilators get big, it's gonna wanna push that wire forward with it. And your other hand's job is to prevent the wire from actually being pushed forward. Because if you're not doing that, you could actually back wall and destroy the vessel. So the wire stays stationary like the track of a monorail. The dilator is the monorail train itself moving over that stationary wire. Now, of course, when you're racking, you're slightly moving the wire forward in the vessel and backwards, but only by like a portion of a centimeter or a centimeter, um, and that's fine. But the point is you can't let, as you're exerting forward pressure on the dilator, that wire move in with it, or otherwise that dilator is no longer safely kept within the center of the vessel and it could destroy things. And this is super easy to do with big dilators. So uh, this can't be stressed enough. The wire stays stationary in the vessel or inside the plural space while the dilator moves over it. If 
I have to get this in right now or the patient's going to die or it's an eCPR case, I might choose to continue just advancing the dilator. So why don't we do that first? So in a no time situation, I'm going to gently push on this dilator with a twisting motion in one direction. And for me, that's clockwise. I'm going to push and twist, push and twist, push and twist. And now each time I get new resistance, rack the wire to make sure that resistance is not from uh, pre-kinking or kinking of the wire. Push and twist, rack, push and twist, rack. Now, if I have a little bit of time, then I'm going to do something taught to me by Vin Pellegrino from the Alford. And Vin said that dilation is just like medical school. You go in straight and you come out twisted. Well, that's the next step of good dilation. And it's a technique I call twist and rip. And what you're going to do now is instead of just reaching resistance and trying to get past it, when you reach resistance and rack your wire to make sure that it's not from kinking, what you're going to do now is, again, you're going to twist in one direction, but you're not going to continue to advance. You're just going to keep enough gentle pressure on the dilator to keep you in place as you twist. And now what you're doing when you're twisting is you're actually taking all of that uh, subcutaneous tissue, all that fascia, and twisting it around the dilator. And you're continuing to have gentle pressure inwards to uh, keep you in place. And you're twisting a few times. And then you do the rip. You move out a couple of centimeters and while you're maintaining the rotational pressure. And what that does is it rips all of the fascia that you've just wrapped around your dilator. And now you re-advance and at this point your advancement will be further than it was before until you reach resistance. Rack, twist, 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 rip. Okay, let's quickly see this in real life. This is a pigtail placement. You can see he's twisting. Twisting. And now put, look at all that tissue that's getting torn as he tears that out. Re-advance, rack, twist, 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 rip. Re-advance, twist, 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 rip. And each time I'm doing that, I feel stuff ripping with the uh, withdrawal of that dilator. And this is the way that you get through tough muscle with huge dilators. And there's no situation you'll feel this more than when you're putting in either that pigtail or the percutaneous chest tube. Uh, you will feel each time huge amounts of fibers ripping as you twist and rip. Okay, now eventually you will get all the way into the patient's vessel or into their pleural space. We'll do one more twist and rip here. And that should get us through. Yep, we are now through. Now, the next technique is called pinch and pull. And this is how to take a large dilator out off a wire. And pinch and pull involves pinching the wire maybe, uh, I don't know, four or five centimeters away from the back of the dilator. You pinch and then you pull towards your fingers. And then you regrip with a pinch. Pull. And what this does is it keeps the wire from bowing, and you're not going to be able to see it on this, but when you get these long floppy wires and these long dilators, if you do not pinch as you pull, uh, the wire could actually get pulled out or bowed or all sorts of stuff you don't want. So the way you take dilators out is you pinch and you pull towards your fingers, pinch, pull. Those are the techniques that make up the micro skill of dilation.